Last year, I gave a similar talk to this, and it, but the title was a little too clever. The title was, The Client is Not Always Right, and it was a joke about the Open ID Connect client. And then I got comments back about, no, the customer is already right. What are you talking about? So I decided to make this talk a little more uh, obvious. And really what I wanted to, to help people understand is how to write good Open ID Connect client software. So if you don't know, that's me, um, updated picture. A lot of people know my, my hat picture from like 10 years ago, but um, actually I'm getting older. I now, I switched to glasses and so I think I'm gonna update. So I'm, I'm pre-marketing my, maybe a new picture. <laughs> um, so yeah, back to the topic at hand. So, you know, at Glue, we write, um, we have a server, an OpenID Connect um, server. And sometimes I'm in the unfortunate position where I'm reviewing customers' implementations and I notice that they leave a little bit to be desired. And I like this picture because it sort of makes the point that we can have the most secure server in the world and if you don't do what you're supposed to do on the client side, then it's not gonna work. You know, you're not gonna wanna drive this thing around. <laughs> so um, let me just level set a little bit. Brian did a really good job um, introducing some of the concepts, but our industry has a ton of jargon and for a lot of jargon for the same stuff. So I'm gonna stick with this jargon, so I just wanna tell you what jargon I'm using. Um, you know, in OpenID Connect, we might call this person, the human, the carbon-based life form, the subject or the sub or the user. I'm gonna stick with user. I actually like person better myself because I feel like user makes me think of like IV user and I'm, I don't like user, but everyone seems to know what user means. Um, you could say that's the meat because um, if we have um, cyberspace is the digital world, the meat space is like the world where we actually work around, walk around in. But uh, I'll stick with user. And browser, um, there's a lot of confusion sometimes about is it the browser or the thing that's talking to the browser. But, the, but remember, the browser's there, and, the, and, and in SAML we call this the user agent. That's a horrible name. So I'm gonna stick with browser. Um, in SAML, we'd call this thing the SP. So what does the browser talk to? You know, you write a CGI program, you have the browser displays, and the CGI program does stuff. So that CGI program, the stuff that's running on the server, that's what we're calling the client. So the client is the software that acts on the user's behalf. It could be the relying party, the RP, the SP. Um, let's just stick with the really generic term client. And then finally, in the end, we have what in SAML we would call the IDP, the identity provider. In OpenID Connect, we call it the OpenID provider, or the OP. Um, in OAuth, and generally, the, uh, in OpenID Connect, which is a profile of OAuth 2, the OpenID provider would be um, the authorization server, the thing that issues tokens. Um, so, but I'm gonna stick with OP, OpenID provider, when I talk about this thing. So OpenID Connect is really um, interesting because one of the design philosophies was to keep simple things simple, but also to make hard things possible. So you can do different types of implementations of OpenID Connect that achieve different security levels. Um, th this is a slide from Nat. Um, he gave a couple of years ago at CIS, and I really love this slide um, because um, it sort of shows you, you know, at the bottom, if you do nothing else and you just use OAuth, um, it's not that it's insecure. I mean, it has, security is always about risk. As we do more stuff, we can mitigate more types of risk. And so if you do the bare minimum amount of OAuth stuff, you're at one sort of at the bottom, but, we, but OpenID Connect builds on top of that and adds more features that, give you, that mitigate more risks and give you higher levels of security. So I sort of like this diagram, it shows OAuth at the bottom. Uh, if you're using the implicit flow, um, so you have a JavaScript application or some type of other public application that can protect secrets, um, it's not as secure, not saying it's insecure, it doesn't mitigate as many risks, but it's not as secure as the code flow where we have 
a client that can protect a client secret. Um, and, and we can go up from there. And you'll find that, the, for example, in the financial sector, um, they're defining a very um, a prescriptive profile of, of, of OpenID Connect that uses every security feature known to man plus a couple, and they're getting an even higher level of security. So just, just to make this point again, because I, I, I would say, you know, sometimes I feel like the OpenID Connect specs, they're well specified, but they're not always so easy to read. And I find that a lot of customers call and ask questions about when I should use the implicit flow versus the code flow. So let me just point out the essential difference between these two is that in the code flow, the client has client credentials. So if you've ever called an API and you know there's an API key in secret, those are the client credentials. How do we authenticate the client? And those, and that, that you know, makes it a little more secure. If you're writing a mobile app, it can be decompiled. If you're writing a JavaScript app, it's really hard to protect any secret in there. So in that case, we use the implicit channel and, the, and there's no client credentials. Um, oh, these terms, front channel and back channel, that used to get me confused when I first started in the industry. So front channel is something that uses the browser. And the back channel is something that's like an API call. It's a server to server call. And that's a really important um, distinction because the front channel, the browser, all sorts of stuff can go wrong there. It can have malware. Um, is it basically, it's much riskier to, to do stuff through the front channel or the browser than it is on the back channel where we're, you need to SSH into there. It's, it's just more security we can do on the back end than on, than on the front end. So let's talk about, um, first of all, show of hands. I, I can't really, I can barely see you, but I'll try. But um, how many people are writing OpenID Connect client software? Custom. Okay. I think that's a, because so this talk really, um, if you're just configuring a client that already supports OpenID Connect, this is what they should be doing. But if you're writing your own clients, this is like sort of the minimum of what you should do. Um, uh, one thing that uh, you should always look for is be very wary if you see stuff in the URL because the URL um, gets logged in a lot of places. So, for example, um, if it's being proxied, um, the web server might log it. Um, the browser might log it, too. The browse, remember, there's a browser history. Um, so the browser might log it. So be very, very careful about putting anything in the URL. Um, there's this thing called the form post response mode. Um, if you ever look at the OpenID Connect homepage, you'll see that they have this little box in there for, for form post response. Um, what that means is that the server, when it sends, calls the, the client with the information, it basically uses um, a form um, which gets auto submitted. So it's a more secure way to, to send a message to the client in the body of the message rather in the U than in the URL. Um, this, this pattern's also used in SAML, um, too, but it, it's a really kind of basic thing that you want to do to prevent anything from leaking in the, in the URL or in the logs. Um, so, um, you know, clients, it, client authentication has been happening a long time. Like, in the old days, um, as Brian mentioned, we would put, um, you know, the, the web server would do client authentication. So you put your client credentials in basic, you know, encoding in, um, in your headers and you call a request. And even Apache, like from the 90s, could do this. But we decided that, well, it's actually, instead of using this basic authentication mode for web servers, let's actually have clients authenticate and get a token. And as, and as soon as we introduced that pattern, there's different ways that we could authenticate clients. So API key and secret is the one that we see a lot used, um, and that's, that's fine. Um, there's different ways you can send this, this, this secret. You could use your basic authorization header. You could use parameters. Um, OpenID Connect defines these four ways um, that you can, when you're calling the token endpoint and you need to authenticate your client, remember in the code flow, it's the code plus the client credentials, so when you're doing that, um, you, you authenticate at the token endpoint. So um, there's what, the one that I really want to talk about is private key authentication. Um, this is where 
the client registers a public key during client registration and, authentic and the authentication at the token endpoint is more secure because the, um, it's not based on shared secrets. So because the server only has the public key, um, then it's not, um, um, the server d literally doesn't have the, the, the shared secret. So client secret JWT, um, I have that secret sent in the clear, not sent in the clear. I guess you'd have to use um, encryption in order to make that happen. Um, so let's see, there we go. Okay, so basic OAuth stuff. Um, now, when you, um, state is the parameter that's defined in OAuth. Um, and it's, if you think about an OAuth client, the um, client um, sends the user to be authenticated and then it gets a call back. So the server um, sends the user um, back to the, um, to the client. Um, so you think about that callback URL. Anybody could call that, that callback URL. Um, any, any hacker or could really just start trying to spam that thing. So the state gives us a way to say, if there's some state parameter that I don't know about, I'm gonna drop the request. I'm not even gonna look at the request because this is an unknown state. Um, this solves a, um, some security challenges um, and it, it defeats, this is the most common OAuth um, vulnerability. I'm not gonna go into detail here, I have a link um, to a good blog about it from Twobo, um, but um, CSRF, um, you have to, the client has to make sure that it's actually um, processing a request that it sent. So the ID token, as, as Brian pointed out, the ID token is like a SAML assertion. Um, the SAML assertion's XML, the ID token's JSON. So what does an identity assertion have? It has one part that tells you about um, how the, the, the who, what, where, when, and why of the authentication, what kind of authentication happened, and has another part that optionally contains attributes of the user. So in this part about the, the what kind of authentication happened, we have some really vital security information. Who issued the token? Um, when was the token issued? When did the person authenticate? You know, who is the subject? Um, so um, now the nonce, remember I was saying that the state is something that you should verify that, that, that didn't change. So the server just returns the state unchanged back to the client. The nonce serves a similar purpose, except that because it's in the ID token, it's potentially signed. So if you're using and validating the nonce, you potentially d really don't have to also validate the state. Um, it would serve that purpose. Um, but is it expired? Um, anyway, these are sort of the, the minimum things, I think. If you just get the ID token and you don't look at any of that stuff it gives you, then it's not really, you're just not using it. Um, Brian had almost the same exact slide, and he might have used even the same exact token. I gotta look at it. Um, but, um, so verifying the signature is important. Um, I mean, I think that's a minimum. Um, Encryption is optional, but 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 the getting verif verifying the signature I think is essential um, on the on the ID token. Oops, did I skip one? Um, Open ID Connect um, 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 working uh, working group has published some guides. So if you're implementing a basic client or implicit client, they actually lay out all the things you're supposed to do. So actually, um, take a look at those. Um, okay, so so more advanced stuff. The ID token, um, if you use especially the hybrid flow, put some other stuff in there that's pretty interesting. Um, a bunch of hashes. The C hash is a hash of the code. So in the code flow, you get back the code, you present the code plus your client credentials at the token endpoint. And the, the C hash gives you back a, a hash of the code. Um, so the at hash is a hash of the access token. Um, the S hash is a hash of the state. Um, and so there's some more um, um, things you can validate, um, issued at, auth time, um, what else? Okay, so hybrid flow. So OAuth defines code flow and implicit flow, and OpenID Connect um, wanted to add some more stuff so to, to enable more secure implementations, so they created this thing called hybrid flow. And what hybrid flow means 
is that when you call the authorization endpoint, um, you can also get back tokens, especially an ID token. Um, so, and that, and that can help your security. So typically in the code flow, you call the authorization endpoint, the person authenticates, you get back a code, you take the code plus the, your client cred to get a token. But in the hybrid flow, instead of getting back the, just the code, you could also get back the ID token. When you call the token endpoint, you'll get back another ID token. So you'll end up with two ID tokens, which is a little confusing. But that first ID token lets you validate some of that extra stuff I was talking about in the previous slide. Um, but bottom line is, if you're, if you're writing a, so an app that has higher security requirements, then I would recommend implementing the hybrid flow. Um, okay. Um, now, most of the stuff I've been talking to you about has been about validating the um, stuff that's coming back from the server, from the, from the OP. But actually, the OP may, might want to validate some of the stuff that's coming from the client. Um, you'll especially see this in the banking, open banking recommendations to use what are called request objects or request URIs. Um, remember how I said, don't put things in the parameter? Um, that's bad. So what a request object is, is just a JSON that takes all of the um, parameters that you would have sent and you, instead of sending them all individually, you can send one parameter that says request object equals, and you send this JSON thing. Um, so it's better for security, um, but especially if you e encrypt that request object, um, then it becomes harder for uh, a man in the middle or attacker to, um, to use that request object um, against you. Um, open banking has actually introduced request object registration which is even one step further, which is saying, I don't even want to send the request object as part of the request. I want to register that request object at some server, and then I just want to pass a URL to tell the OP, here's where you get the request object. So this is taking it one level even further. This is an important little caveat. Um, if, you're, um, if you're OpenID Connect client, supports multiple o OPs, you should use a different redirect URI or callback for each OP. And let's see. Um, so I mentioned that encryption, I think a lot of people think that encryption is required. Um, and actually, one of the questions I ask people who interview at GLUE is, is the ID token sent in the clear or encrypted? And the, there's a fair amount of like developers think it's encrypted. It's not encrypted, it's encoded. Um, big difference. Um, so, but you can, OpenID Connect defines how you can use encryption. Both the server and the client can, can use encryption. Um, and it does create some implementation challenges because you, it's harder to pass an encrypted token to, um, to other services um, because you'd need to make sure that they had the private key. But, um, but in, in transactions where you need to mitigate more risks, encryption is really a, a must have. So OpenID Connect um, allows the client to signal to the server how to authenticate the user. And the only parameter that you can really do this with is ACR values. Um, ACR stands for Authentication Context Class Reference. It's sort of a vestigial from SAML. And um, I, why it's ACR and not ACCR, I have no idea, but I guess it's catchier. So, um, so for example, we, when we're, when we're um, sending the user to be authenticated at the authorization endpoint, we could say ACR values equals U2F. And this is a way to signal to the OP what type of work authentication workflow we want to put the user through. So um, if you don't specify an ACR, then the server's going to have to pick some for you. Um, default ACRs is a, something that you can register during client registration to say, this, is, this client is a TV. Always use TV authentication. Um, and note, the ACR comes back to you in the ID token, and you should validate that. And, and Brian made a good pitch for U2F, but I also think um, I'm a big fan of, of FIDO, all the FIDOs, U2F, UAF, FIDO2. Um, and they're one of the only protocols that stop man-in-the-middle attacks. 
Okay, so more OAuth stuff. Um, remember, this is a big topic. O o OAuth is 16 RFCs, there's 16 drafts RFCs. Um, OpenID Connect has a bunch of um, um, standards themselves. There's Cord, Client Registration, Discovery, Form Post Response. So OAuth has become a really big um, um, domain. And, um, and, so, and as we go, and as attacks happen, we keep adding these new um, um, standards or recommendations um, to mitigate these additional attacks. PKCE um, came about to try and find a way to more secu to secure public clients. So if you're using the implicit flow because you have a mobile app or you have a JavaScript app, then uh, we can protect a client secret. So just to oversimplify a little bit, PKCE says, let's just register a new client secret for every transaction, um, and that way we don't have to hard code one. Um, but it's really essential. If you're writing a public client and you're not using that, then it's, you, you basically have gone down the security level um, quite a bit. Um, Brian mentioned mutual TLS, which, which he's the primary author of. So um, the mutual TLS means that we can use the web server and the web browser um, to make a secure connection, and that's really useful to prevent man-in-the-middle attacks. Um, token binding accomplishes the same thing. Um, and, and the basic cha problem is, is that you can see in this diagram how channel one and channel two are different. And what we really want to do is enable the browser to fail or the OP to fail if they see that channel one is not equal to channel two, which means that there's some man in the middle. So that's, that's the point of, of token binding. Um, but token binding and mutual TLS do the same thing in sort of different ways. They make sure that that SSL connection um, is from the browser to, to the OP. Doing really good on timing here. Um, so software statements is an area where I don't see a lot of uptake of software statements, but I think we're gonna see more. So dynamic client registration says anybody who can hit the dynamic client registration can register. But how do you know if that's an internal client who's registering or a third party that you trust um, or just some third party that you don't know? So a software statement's like a token for um, client registration. So you present this software statement, which is a jot, um, and it enables the OP to verify and read that software statement and then perhaps give different um, um, rights or to, to the client that's been registered. So for example, what attributes should we release or what claim should we release to this client? Well, if we know it's an internal client that we can trust, we can release more information. Um, so um, in, okay, so in the Federation, so there's a new dr um, draft spec at OpenAD Foundation called the Federation spec and this, um, um, in, this, in that spec, they define something called metadata statements, which is sort of like a software statement. So it's, it's something that could be presented at client registration. It's also a jot, so they're pretty close. But the, I, I think what we need more of is um, to build ecosystems that can enable developers to um, help themselves and get client credentials, but we need to maintain some of that trust and so I think that we need more work in this area around um, how do we convey that trust from the developer all the way to registering the client and getting client creds. Because it's garbage in, garbage out. If we issue the wrong client creds to the wrong person, um, it's, what's the point? So, so these are crypto guidelines that I mostly still from uh, Open Banking Group. Um, but there's some basic minimum, you know, you don't want to use, for example, um, the wrong key size. And so the, these are some um, sort of best practices about if you're using encryption or you're using signing, what are the algorithms? And I'm sure with um, organic computing or whatever they call it, quantum computing, what do they call it? Or qu yeah, like all this stuff is like, this is a moving target. Um, but as of, as of right now, the, the, you know, this is okay. Um, and I talked a little bit about um, federation and about, because a lot of the internet is about trust. So 
the internet is the world's biggest federation, but there's no trust. I trust that you're using IP addresses and DNS, and that's the, the extent of trust that we have on the internet today. But what we need is to know, I trust this domain because they're a partner, and the federation um, um, spec enables these richer trust models um, to be developed within an ecosystem. Um, I'm also co-chair of a group called Kantara Auto, um, which is also saying, okay, once the OpenID Federation spec defines some of the plumbing of how this is gonna work, and Auto defines some of the APIs for how a federation could enroll an IDP or a website um, and, and, and give them meta metadata statements that they could use. Um, so one more thing I should mention here. So the trust model of, of, um, of, the, of OpenID and SAML, it's really all hangs off of TLS. So I'm making an HTTPS connection from my browser to the OP, and I'm trusting that I'm connecting to the right OP. If DNS is hacked and I connect to the wrong website and there's some type of certificate that still looks green, like all the bets are off. So this is a lot of, um, of, of um, risk that's basically being put into the TLS SSL part of the, of the network. So how can we build, get more trust than just saying, okay, I validated the cert? And one of those ways is using a federation that publishes the public keys. And that way, I can, valid, if I, I can validate those public keys, not just based on the fact that I made an HTTPS connection and downloaded them, but on the fact that some central provider, i.e. the federation, has, um, has published these keys and has, ver uh, has verified the integrity of them. So it creates, if I'm a hacker, I now not only have to hack DNS, um, but I also have to hack the federation and get them to publish the wrong keys. So it makes it a little more secure. So I wanna talk about three client approaches. Um, there's a lot of good clients out there. So um, there's a RP certification from OpenID Foundation. But I just want to talk about three different approaches that I like. Um, so one approach I like is use the web server plugin approach. Um, I, uh, these are two plugins um, written by the same guy, Hans Zenbel, formerly a ping, you might know him. Um, and he, um, one is for Apache, one is for Nginx. And um, these, these are really good clients. And if you don't want to, if you want to like sort of let somebody else worry about all this stuff that I was telling you about, um, then this is a good way to go. Um, I also really like the update aspects. So if we have a large deployment with lots of clients out there and some OAuth problem is announced, um, what, you, what it means is, is that you're gonna have to look at every client and say, what library are they using? And did that library get updated? And did that updated library get into the code? And do I have to re-QA? And so updating clients can be quite a challenge. So using this type of approach where you've moved some of the client functionality into the web server is tried and true approach and you can update with app update. So that's good. Um, the, the, op the Apache module is one of the first modules that uh, supports token binding. So it's pretty advanced. Um, second approach um, is app auth. And this, this is really a, a unique because it's hard to write PKCE and it's hard to implement this stuff. And AppAuth has given you Android, iOS, and JavaScript implementations that you can really get up and running with much more quickly. So rather than write your own stuff, if you can use AppAuth, I, I highly recommend it. Uh, maintained by Google, published on the OpenID GitHub. Um, the last um, um, client software I want to mention, so I guess it's a little plug for Glue, but um, other, other um, platforms could do the same thing. It's basically a middleware approach. Auth0 is actually not too far from this, but they're offering it as a SaaS. And the idea is, is that developers, I wouldn't say they're lazy, because they're hardworking, but they have a tendency to, once they get something working, um, they stop all the security stuff. Like, okay, it's working, done. Um, and so um, what we really want to do is give developers a higher level APIs that they can call, you know, get token, um, get, get authorization URL, um, get user info. So give them some high level um, um, libraries in their library of choice 
So if you're a Python developer, the first thing you're going to do is look for Python libraries. So give developers high-level interfaces in the platform of their choice is, is the goal. Um, so a middleware approach, if you look at Auth0, for example, one of the things I love about Auth0 is there's a million different libraries for everything, and they do a really good job there. So we, we, we wanted to bring that to open source, and so the way that we do it is, is we have a web service which provides these higher level interfaces, and then you can generate your client software based on those web services. So it's a little confusing because you're saying, well, why am I dropping a server in? I already have an authorization server. It's sort of like a, um, a client service uh, or client middleware. Um, the one advantage of this approach is, like I mentioned for web servers, is that this middleware can be updated without impacting the applications. So if you um, keep the interface the same to the apps, if you want to implement better security or um, you want to fix some vulnerability that was announced, it's much easier if you have that, um, that functionality um, centralized. Um, Oxd also has libraries for UMA and um, OAuth. So OAuth, for example, client credential grant, it's not an OpenID Connect, it's actually an OAuth flow. So um, we have some built-in support for that too. Um, on the front channel, um, Oxd just returns a URL. Um, a lot of people will say, well, why don't you use OpenID Connect? It's already go a pretty good API. But the problem is, is if you look at the request that the developer has to make um, to the authorization endpoint, there's a million parameters. There's client ID. There's, um, you know, state, which has to change every time, as I mentioned. There's, um, you know, response type. So there's a lot of stuff. And, and that, re that request can get pretty long. So what Oxd does is it just returns the request to the client and says, send the user here to this URL. Um, so the, um, it takes away, some, hides some of that complexity because um, OpenID Connect does have a lot of options. Um, oops, one too far. I, I think that's it. Um, questions? I go too, too long or too short? Do I have to play my harp? I have a question. Can you tell people about um, auto and why they should join and how they can join? Okay, so in, in SAML world, we have existing multi-party federations. So if you look in the higher education space, there's something called InCommon. And InCommon has about 600 universities and 100 websites. And the idea is, is that if you're a university and you want to use a website, um, you, you're, you're regulated for privacy, so you need a certain agreement to make sure that that website, if they're breached, is going to notify you, so you can notify your students and, and, and your people. So the, what the Federation does is by creating one standard participant agreement, a university can know that every website has agreed to a certain level of protection of the data and notification requirements. So the Federation drives down the legal um, um, the legal cost of collaboration, but it also provides a good place to offer technical services. Um, so it's, it's what I would define what I call the tools and the rules. So the rules are, you know, you will notify me if you're breached, and the tools are, we're going to use SAML, we're going to use these attributes, we're going to use these sort of technical conventions. So because SAML federations were working well, we said, well, wouldn't it be great if o we had this for OpenID and OAuth? And it was sort of missing, and I was sort of hoping somebody else would do it. I would just start it, and somebody else would sort of run with it. But it turns out that we're, um, we've been working on it for a couple of years now. Um, but I think that what we are seeing is, is that um, the federated approach works in certain ecosystems. So if you're, let's say, an ecosystem with, let's say, maybe 10 to 1,000 um, members or participants, the federated approach is a, is a good one. If it's super big, if you have millions of, of participants, and federation's probably not for you. But there is, you know, within that sort of like middle range of the number of participants, um, federation, because it saves money. I mean, it drives down the legal and technical costs of collaboration, so. Awesome, other questions? No? 
No? Okay. I'm off the hook. You're off the hook. Round of applause <laughs> for Mike. Thank you.